Square Enix invited me to an event where I got to play Final Fantasy 16 for well over six hours. And while it was a development build that will have changes in the final release, I get to tell you what I experienced and my impressions on the game. And I'm going to do just that. We're going to talk about everything in this video. Gameplay, graphics, performance, audio, story, abilities, items, and my absolute favorite thing in the entire event, icon fights. Trust me, you want to hear about that. However, if you want more in-depth information into particular systems, then make sure you subscribe as I'm going to be breaking things down over the upcoming days and going over everything with a fine-toothed comb. Also, if you're watching this video the day after it was uploaded, be sure to check the description or pinned comments for the link to my playlist for Final Fantasy 16. Now, before I break this video down and go through each section, I want to give my honest thoughts about what I experienced and how I feel the equipment used impacted the experience. Firstly, it played on a normal PS5. We had access to the official Sony PS5 headset for audio, and the screen we played on was, I believe, a 40-inch TV from Samsung. It was not an outstanding panel, though, but was a nice middle ground option that most people with a 4K 60Hz panel will experience. Firstly, the game had much darker undertones than I had expected. We knew it was going to be dark from the trailer, but I honestly underestimated just how dark. Now, this game does have an R18 age rating for a reason, and from what I experienced, I love it. On the gameplay side, yes, it's not turn-based. However, don't hold that against it. It might be action like Devil May Cry, however, it's smoother more intricate and detailed that matches a Final Fantasy main title. If you're worried about Final Fantasy 15 or 7 Remake, throw that idea out of your head. It is nothing like them. Now, I'm not a big fan of action RPGs. However, here I find myself wanting more. The options we have to make the game as easy or as hard as we want are lovely additions as well. This is a game everybody can play and a lot will play well, but to truly master the gameplay, that's going to take a lot of skill. But while you're practicing that skill, you can sit there listening to Soken's arrangement for the game, which I found interesting to say the least. It's weird how you can go from calm and relaxed to tense, to anger, to sorrow in mere moments without it feeling weird or out of place. But he found a way, and it's a way I wish other games could replicate. Now, I make no attempts to hide my dislike for Final Fantasy XV, and I make no attempts to hide my dislike for Seven Remake. I have no such worry from what I experienced though. I do think this is a return to the glory days of titles like FF10 or FF9. I'm unsure I experienced too little of the story to make an assumption on that, but I'm not saying the possibility is zero either. The emotion from the characters and the dark tone of the game truly deserving of an R18 mature rating work well in this case, but it's very different to what we're used to with Final Fantasy. The gameplay is fun, fast paced, you have complete control of the difficulty, and I honestly want more right now, which is something I've never said about an action game before. There is one thing I'm sure of though from my day of playing, it's in for a real chance at winning game of the year, in my opinion. Now, let's break things down and go into a little more detail, shall we? I know everybody wants it the most, but we'll get to gameplay shortly, I promise. Let's start this off with graphics, as there's some very important things to talk about here. 
Firstly, while it was not in the demo version we got to play, the full release will feature an option to choose between performance mode, which is optimized for high frame rates, and graphical mode, optimized to take advantage of every bit of power the PlayStation 5 has to boost the graphical fidelity to the maximum. Now, I said our demo build that we got to experience did not have this option. As such, I don't know if it was optimized for FPS or for graphics. What I can say, however, is it doesn't matter. The game ran smoothly at 60 FPS with no noticeable drops during any cutscenes, exploration, or combat. And this is the big one. During combat, there are a lot of flashy effects, animations, and things happening on screen in general. I have noticed huge FPS drops in other games with less happening on screen at once. However, here, combat is extremely fluid even during the most rigorous of combat combos that light up the screen and while there was no fps drops the game looked truly truly stunning it has a very far draw distance allowing you to really experience the world around you you can see the fine cracks in a castle wall and even foliage way off in the distance when you're sitting on the side of a building and this is all with seamless loading, something we're going to talk about now. The game is based upon a seamless nature. This means you go from cutscenes straight into gameplay and vice versa. Not only that, it's the same with combat. You'll go from exploring the area straight into combat without a loading screen, a transition or even a battle begin screen. Your exploration controls are exactly the same as battle controls, and as such, it's almost like always being in a state of combat, but also always being in a state of exploration. Once a fight is done, there's no EXP screen or drop screen except after boss battles. EXP, ability points, and gill or a small addition on the side of the screen showing you what you earned and item drops are small orbs dropped on the floor which you will auto collect when running over them for normal fights. Now I mentioned there's no loading even for cutscenes. You go from walking through a door straight to a cutscene plane in a seamless nature by the way of how the camera angles pan around. There's no black screens to wait on, and once a cutscene finishes, you take over right away. And the reason? Nothing is pre-rendered. It's all rendered in-game, which means you're never waiting around for anything. This also means there's none of that jarring annoyance that happens when you go from an immaculate-looking CGI to a downscaled gameplay model. It's all equal here. But I think one of the biggest things to talk about when it comes to graphics is the lighting and the level of detail. Both of these do go hand in hand, but the lighting really shows the dark nature of the game. Something I really underplayed from watching the trailers. I had expected things to be toned down from the trailers. However, things are darker than I imagined. And I don't mean that in terms of environment. I mean in the fact you can see the glistening red wet blood just drip down Clive's face and body. The sheen on armor and swords, which dulls them more and more with blood on them. You can easily see the detail on stone walls, NPC characters, foliage, and even wooden fences. You can tell a lot of attention was paid to the way this game looks, just like previous titles. Now, unlike previous titles, let's talk gameplay, the most polarizing topic when it comes to Final Fantasy 16 because it's an action RPG instead of turn-based. Initially, from trailers, I was getting a very Devil May Cry feeling, and I can honestly say, yes, it's not turn-based. But also, forget everything about 7 Remake, forget about 15, this is a very different feeling to it. 
and firstly let me just say while it is an action rpg there are some additions which even those who have never played an action rpg in their life before will be able to pick up and play this game like any other while the gameplay itself is similar to devil may cry it's not quite the same you have the same level of craziness with the combo chains however it is so much more detailed and intricate it essentially takes action games and adds rpg nature to it we got to experience playing with three icon abilities we could use garuda phoenix and titan but also we experienced torgle clive's companion dog who assists in combat now let's talk about how combat works firstly square is your normal attack combo for basic sword slashes triangle is how you use magic which is linked to the icon you are challenging at the time for example if phoenix is equipped you cast fire and fire a magic with Titan, it's Stone and Stonera. Circle is a unique effect for each icon. Phoenix has a Gap Closer, which is a little bit like Warp Strikes from FF15. However, these do not use resources nor have any cooldowns. Titan has an Earth Shield for blocking, and Garuda shoots out a claw which grabs enemies and draws them to you, with X being Jump. However, you can hold R2, which then changes your normal combo and magic ability to icon exclusive attacks, which you can unlock via the ability menu, which is very fundamentally like Tales of Arise in functionality. You have a main wheel for Clive and a unique wheel for each icon, which contains abilities that you can unlock to learn and then continue to add ability points to upgrade them, which can increase their damage or their stagger ability. You can change your equipped channeled icon in battle at any time as well by pressing L2. This means you can go from burning everything to the ground with Phoenix straight into crushing their leftover dust into diamonds by using Titan in the same combo in an extremely fluid motion. This means you can learn to become a master of a huge number of combos and chains. And speaking of fluid though, dodging actually works here. It can take a little getting used to, but it's fast and responsive. You aren't going to get clipped by anything after you've already dodged, and it leads to counter opportunities. Not on the level of Dark Souls, where you can only get one or two hits in before you back away, but in a sense, you can immediately start juggling mobs or keeping them at a distance with magic attacks. But what about those who have trouble with action RPGs? Well, there is no difficulty selection in Final Fantasy 16. However, there is something better. A way to create your own difficulty in the option of five accessories which you can use in game to make things easier for you now i should note here however is we were told that we could only equip two of these however when i played naturally i tried to break something and i was able to equip three of them one in each accessory slot with no issue Firstly, we have the Timely Ring of Striking, which, when equipped, allows you to use your single square button to unleash combos while automatically switching your channeled icon and using their unique abilities as well. Next, we have the Timely Ring of Focus. This one gives you a little bit extra time to dodge, roughly an extra half a second. It doesn't sound like a lot, but is huge it essentially slows the game down during certain attacks and gives you a prompt to press r1 to dodge attacks then we have the timely ring of evasion this is an upgraded version of the previous ring which will just entirely automatically dodge some attacks however unavoidable attacks will not be dodged and neither will all base attacks then we have the Timely Ring of Healing, a simple ring that will automatically use potions for you when your health drops below 25%. However, since we were limited to just four potions in this trial version, I don't know how helpful this one will actually be. 
And last but not least is the timely ring of assistance, which automatically gives commands to Torgal, Clive's loyal hound, where it will have him heal you or attack enemies for you. Okay, now let's talk audio the soundtrack for this game is composed by Sokan, and i know everybody who plays final fantasy 14 is just cheering uncontrollably right now there's good reason to however there is also something a little jarring at times but we'll get to that in a moment firstly the voice acting characters have real emotion and at the very least for english voices they match we are long past the time of voices not matching characters now, but it still happens every now and again. Or you have a little moment where a line just doesn't sound right. In the portion that I played, however, there was none of this. I got attached to the characters instantly. Sidolphus's mannerisms, Clive's anger and inner sorrow, Benedicta's fury and longing, the connections characters share with each other and what the current situations are doing to them you can't help but get sucked into what they're saying and their emotions you easily pick up on the subtle atmospheric changes which is helped by the soundtrack even though i only had a day to get hands-on with the game and i wanted to make the absolute most of every second i actually found myself just sitting there for nearly 10 minutes just listening to the music now i was sad that nobu uematsu did not create another godly soundtrack but not anymore i experienced a handful of arrangements while playing it builds tension when it needs to it builds excitement it builds a relaxing nature now i often listen to a lot of ost tracks from ff7 through to 10 as they are my favorite tracks however there is at least three tracks i experienced that i will absolutely be adding to my playlist for sure Sokan does an amazing job in Final Fantasy XIV, but for every good piece of music he makes in that game, there's at least one more that I'm just not fond of. So far though, that didn't happen to me after a day of playing in 16. Now, I mentioned something jarring earlier, and that's every now and again, the background music would be rather calming and relaxing, but then changes over to a more serious track this is likely a cause of the seamless loading though and should be an easy simple fix for them to implement slight curves just to help offset the change over a little now let's talk about items we have our normal items such as potions etc however we also have a crafting system this is something we did not have access to in our playtest however we did have for access to the crafting materials and these are following a rarity system we found a few different tiers of items and mobs have unique drops we know this as joining me at the hands-on was withered waste my cameraman and discord and twitch admin he got an item drop from a mob that i did not as i got a normal white rarity the most common item and he got a purple rarity now we don't know what hierarchy the items have however we can assume white is the most common aside from that we found green blue and purple items that are tagged as crafting materials some of them i'm led to believe are used to craft accessories which boost icon abilities and because of this i believe it's a general equipment crafting as well for swords and armors however we also had access to consumable items that had a slightly different icon as well so maybe craftable consumables as well but as i say we had no access to the feature so i'm afraid i can't talk too much about this as all we have to go on is the item drops okay now let's talk about my absolutely most favorite thing to experience at the event icon fights there are two different versions of this clive versus icon and icon versus icon 
Each icon fight is also unique and different to each other. We got to experience a fight against Garuda during the Clive vs Garuda fight. I had a very Final Fantasy XIV style feeling, but also totally different. I know that sounds weird, but it's honestly hard to explain. The fight was absolutely a blast. Dodging tornadoes, Garuda quite literally ripping the ground up around us to throw at us, staggering Garuda and slamming her head down into the ground to lay the damage on. It was a pure wrestling match, pretty much. A real we're going to fight to the death moment. A really unique experience. However, all icon fights are going to have a theme. Phoenix, for example, the way it was described to us is almost like a, a Panzer Dragoon experience. And to make things better, we know of Bahamut, Garuda, Ifrit, Phoenix, Ramu, Titan, and Odin as icons. The cool factor, though, comes in the form of Icon vs. Icon. We got to fight Garuda as Ifrit, and it was amazing. I was, I was burning the landscape around me. The trees and the ground were burning from my attacks. I was destroying the landmass. You even see Garuda's feathers slowly burning off into nothingness with my claws wrapped in hellfire or where I'm launching giant fireballs around. It is the, the definition of a land altering battle. And the weird thing is, the gameplay is only half of the side of this fight. It's half gameplay, half cinematic, and it's a flawless transition. It's almost like you're, you're playing a movie, but in a good way. The cutscenes change around what you do in the fight, and the entire time I was fighting Garuda, I just had my mouth wide open for the sheer the sheer epicness of the whole experience. If it is the real personification of Hellfire and we got to experience it in the best way possible. Now I've talked a lot in this video about a wide number of things however there's still a lot of detail left out of this because if I included everything this video would easily be five hours long so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down everything I experienced over the upcoming days this means dedicated videos to icon versus icon fights combat abilities item graphics etc i'm going to break it all down and go over it with a fine tooth comb so you can all know exactly what happened when i got to play the game and to learn every single detail of the game which i learned so make sure you hit that subscribe button so you do not miss them and of course if you enjoyed this video then make sure you hit that like button it would really mean a lot to me and of course feel free to drop a comment. I am now allowed to talk about absolutely everything I experienced, so ask away with your questions. As always, though, thanks for watching, and I will see you soon.